please stand for our opening hymn, verses 1, 2, and 6 of hymn 493. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be his kingdom now and forever. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, you have built your church upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Grant us so to be joined together in unity of spirit by their teaching, that we may be made a holy temple acceptable to you, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated for the readings. A reading from Lamentations. This I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul that seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for one to bear the yoke in youth, to sit alone in silence when the Lord has imposed it, to put one's mouth to the dust, there, yet may, there may yet be hope, to give one's cheek to the smiter and be filled with insults, for the Lord will not reject forever. Although he causes grief, he will have compassion according to the abundance of his steadfast love 
for he does not willingly afflict or grieve anyone. The word of the Lord. of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Lord Jesus Christ. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus came and says, when he saw him and fell down at his feet, begged him repeatedly, my little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, so that she may be made well and live. So he went with him. And a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had, and she was not better and rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, if I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately her hemorrhage stopped and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that the power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say, who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him and told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, your daughter is dead. What tr trouble, why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, do not fear, but believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. When he had entered, he said to them, why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitakum, which means, little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk around. She was 12 years of age. At this, they were overcome with amazement 
he strictly ordered them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. The Gospel of the Lord. While he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing them, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, Do not be afraid, only believe. In the name of one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen. Oswald Chambers once noted, the remarkable thing about fearing God is that when you fear God, you fear nothing else. Whereas if you do not fear God, you fear everything else. Now that is perhaps a bit of an overstatement, but I like the way that he thinks, because it is fear more than anything else that so often keeps us from trusting God and saying yes to a larger life. I mean, right? Consider the fear Abram must have felt when told to leave the land of Haran in his late 70s, or how afraid Moses must have been to confront Pharaoh, or how scared you were when you look back at one of those moments in life when you displayed real courage and chose to be brave, you felt fear, but you moved forward anyway. Jim Hollis is a Jungian analyst and a very thoughtful writer, and on the topic, he writes this, every morning we wake up to find two gremlins at the foot of our bed. One is fear, and the other lethargy. The gremlin of fear whispers, the world is big and you are not. And so you better play it safe and avoid all risk. Meanwhile, the gremlin of lethargy is there at the bed with his own message, which is chill out, have some chocolate, turn on the television, sit back and relax. There's always tomorrow to tackle something larger. Of course, what Hollis then goes on to note is that both gremlins are really just two manifestations of the same underlying reality, which is fear. And it's this fear, he says, that cripples the spiritual life. Now, I say this only to frame today's gospel reading from Mark, where we hear from Jesus the most common commandment in all of Scripture, which, by the way, has nothing to do with money or sex or honesty or even serving the poor, but is actually captured in four simple words, do not be afraid. And what I would like to suggest this morning is that today's gospel is really all about what it means for us to increase our capacity to obey this basic biblical commandment, to live our life with less fear, or if nothing else, to learn to show more courage in the face of our fear. Because first, we have Jairus, a leader of the synagogue whose daughter is about to die. And understandably, he is incredibly scared. And so he begs Jesus to come heal his daughter. Jesus agrees. But then this other woman with a chronic blood condition sneaks up and touches Jesus in the hope of being healed. But then she falls at Jesus' feet Mark tells us, trembling with fear. Meanwhile, Jairus has to be freaking out and getting very impatient. After all, his daughter is about to die. And that is when the one thing that he fears the most happens. 
your daughter is dead, said the messengers. Why bother the teacher anymore? And so really quickly, I just want to pause. I think we know this woman's fear. I think we know Jairus' fear. I think we know the fear of being a human being because each one of us has our moments, our moments when we are terrified that God isn't big enough to take care of us, or moments when we're frightened that Jesus seems to be lagging and our deepest fear will come true. And then, of course, there's just the broader fear that comes with being a human being. Do I have enough money to retire? Will my relationship with blank ever be healed? Is the bump malignant or is it benign? Will I ever get the love or the respect that I deserve? Will the grief I feel over my loved one's death ever heal? These and a million more are the questions that we ask as human beings and we ask them from a place of vulnerability and fear. Well, in the midst of Jairus' fear, and in the midst of our fear as well, comes the command of the living God. Do not fear, only believe. In other words, Jesus' message to Jairus is, to be strong. Trust me. I actually know what I'm doing here. I'm not in a hurry. I'm not anxious. And I don't want you to be anxious or to live your life crippled by fear either. And so as we think about today's gospel story and how to navigate whatever fear or anxiety may be present in our life, here's what I'd like to offer you today, which I extrapolate from today's gospel, and it's sort of a threefold assignment. Number one, enter with Jesus into his death. Number two, from that place, adopt a posture of complete trust and patience. And then three, in God's time, let Jesus take you by the hand and raise you to something new. And so first, we are to enter into Jesus' death, symbolically speaking, because what this gospel ultimately points to is the cross. I mean, right, the crowd is pressing in on Jesus a woman touches him. Jesus has a sensation of weakness, of draining, and Jesus realizes that power has gone out from him. In other words, Jesus lost power so that she could gain it. Jesus suffered a moment of weakness so that she, in fact, could be healed. And friends, that is what the cross of our Lord is all about. As Isaiah put it so long ago, by his stripes we are healed. And this, by the way, is what is so wonderful about Mark's gospel. There's all these details that seem so strange on the surface, but they're always meant to point symbolically to the cross of Jesus, to the death of Jesus, which is a death that you and I have entered into by faith and our baptism. And like this woman, through that death, we too have been healed. Jesus lost power so that we could then find new power, new power to live our life with less fear, and new power to surrender our life to God and to trust in God's goodness in the midst of that fear. And that brings me to the second point, which is that we who share in Christ's death are asked to surrender our lives to Jesus in a posture of trust and patience. You see, Jairus came to Jesus very understandably, thinking that there was nothing more urgent than his request. 
but he had to wait. And you may recall from last, last week's gospel, it was about Jesus calming the storm. But remember, Jesus did not do that immediately. But for a while, he just slept on a cushion in the boat. And what this means is that Jesus' grace and Jesus' love are completely compatible with us going through storms from time to time. And it's in the storm where the act of surrender becomes so important. Because you may have noticed this in your own life, but Jesus will not be hurried when it comes to our urgent demand that he end the storm, whatever the storm means to you. And if we try and impose our schedule and our solution and our timing onto Jesus, we're always going to struggle to feel God's love. And so we who share in Christ's death, we are asked to surrender to God in a posture of trust and patience. And by the way, this is not work that you can do or should do alone. This is the work of a community. And that's why we have the church. It's why the body of Christ is so important that it is together in community that we learn the art of letting go. And then third, and this is the most important of all the three points, we have to see Jesus' tenderness displayed in today's gospel. It is a tenderness that always points to resurrection and to something new that God is doing in our life and in this world. After healing this woman in today's gospel, Jesus looks at her with complete tenderness, and he calls her daughter, which at the time would have conferred so much dignity to this woman who had not been seen, who had been overlooked for 12 years of her life. Or think about when Jesus sits down beside the girl after he heals her. He takes her by the hand and he says, Talitha, which is a term of endearment. A best translation of that would be honey or maybe sweetie. And so what Jesus is doing here with this girl is something her parents might do on any morning, something you've done with your kids at one point in your life. He sits, he takes her by the hand, and he says, honey, it's, it's time to get up. You see, unlike the woman who fell at Jesus' feet in a state of fear and trembling, Mark is asking us to cling to a Messiah, to surrender to a Lord who is tender and who takes us by the hand, even in seemingly dark times, and calls us daughter, calls us son and who leads us beside still waters into something new, if we can just trust and be patient. And so I want to end my sermon this morning by um, sharing my favorite verse in all of Scripture. I was reminded of this verse this week when uh, a friend, uh, someone at the church, asked me, uh, whenever I thought of Jesus' teachings, uh, what came to mind first? And I didn't have to think about it whenever... Uh, I think of Jesus' words, the first thing that always comes to mind for me is Luke chapter 12, verse 32, where Jesus looks at his frightened disciples and says, Fear not, little flock. It is your Father's pleasure to give you the kingdom. Fear not, little flock. It is your Father's pleasure to give you the kingdom. My only request, or or your homework for the week, for those of you who really like homework, is to just reflect on that verse and what it means for your life. It is your Father's pleasure to give you the kingdom. Because as C.S. Lewis once said when asked about... um, 
religious education for good church-going adults like yourself. He said, most Christians at some point in their life do not need to be instructed. What they need is to be reminded. And so today, we can all be reminded that God really is big enough to take care of us. Today we can be reminded that we really are safe in God's hands, and today we can all be reminded of that wonderful promise we have in today's reading from Lamentations, where it says, the Lord will not reject forever. Although he causes grief, he will have compassion according to the abundance of his steadfast love, for God does not willingly afflict or grieve anyone. And then finally, in light of all these truths, I think we can all be reminded of God's most frequent command to his frightened children. Do not be afraid. Let us stand and affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. Grant that every member of the church may truly and humbly serve you. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble. Give to the departed eternal rest. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. Let us pray for our own needs and for those of others. Hasten, O Father, the coming of your kingdom and grant that we, your servants who now live by faith, May with joy behold your Son at his coming in glorious majesty, even Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you.
Good morning. Want to welcome everybody to St. Michael's this morning. It's so good to see everybody. And uh, whether you're joining from home uh, or here with us in person, so glad that you are here. It's a real gift to have you here today. Uh, today uh, at St. Michael's, it's um, one of those bittersweet days, um, sad but also happy in the sense that proud of uh, this person's journey and where it's taking him. But we're going to say goodbye. Um, today to a beloved staff member, Luis Rivas. Um, Luis joined the St. Michael staff in August of 2018 as our student minister, and he is leaving us because he will soon start working on his Master's in Divinity at the Episcopal Seminary of the Southwest as he continues his journey towards the priesthood. Um, for three years, Luis has been on staff, and I can honestly say he has just poured his heart and his soul into his ministry, not just working with our youth, um, but um, you know, one of the things I've learned is to write into every job description this little like asterisk that says there will be other duties as assigned. <laughs> um, Luis has been assigned many other duties uh, since being here, and you know, friends, whenever the pandemic hit, um, so many of you sent words of gratitude over how quickly we were able to get streaming and. Um, but the truth is, I don't even know how to post anything on Instagram. It was Luis who, you know, got in here, started fidgeting with things, and, and got us streaming um, literally the first Sunday um, that uh, we needed to. Um, and that's just one example of his gift and his willingness just to kind of go above and beyond to make our community better. Um, his ministry amongst us has made a tremendous impact. And on a personal note, I just want to say, Louise, how much I'm going to miss working with you, uh, how much I care about you, how proud I am of you. Um, this has been uh, a really special journey, and uh, I'd be a lot more sad if you were, you know, being shipped off to Virginia or a seminary outside of Austin. But it's been a real gift. We are a stronger church uh, because of you and your time here with us. And so, um, I'm going to put Luis here on the spot, make him say a few words, but will y'all just join me in giving a huge round of applause for Luis? The floor is yours, man. Thank you. Uh, thank you to all of you, and I mean thank you for more than just that round of applause, which was great, uh, but also thank you for the past three years. Uh, my time here at St. Michael's has just been uh, such a wonderful blessing, and it's been uh, at a, such a formative time in my life. Uh, I think that part of the reason why being a, a student minister was always so, uh, you know, enticing to me is because I'm like, I feel like I'm still constantly like growing and learning and like learning to get used to like being an adult. So that's not that different from being a teenager, right? Uh, and learning to like be like navigate new things. So, uh, and that's what happened here at St. Michael's. And I, I have felt like uh, such a welcomed, uh, I felt so welcomed and so loved and supported uh, during my time here at St. Michael's and, and everything that's been going on uh, in my life. You know, like I have been here uh, through like a pretty uh, bad like back injury and surgery and everybody here was so caring and so loving and supportive and understanding and that got me through that and then also in the good times and celebrating I met and married my wife Marie uh, in the time that I've been here and that's also been a, a, such a blessing to have you all celebrate and rejoice with me and in, in that and now you know this last uh, moment of celebration I get to spend with you all is the beginning of my uh, journey into ordained ministry and beginning um, my master's at Seminary of the Southwest, which will, God willing, and the people consenting result in me being a priest one day, and all of that in this, in this building, in this church. So I owe you all a tremendous debt of gratitude uh, for your support, for your love, for your caring, for the, the questions of how am I doing, for the uh, encouragements of like the stream looks really good for the um, you know for the students that I've gotten to work with especially um, I wish I could have seen everybody here today I know that this is the summer and uh, you know trickling back in uh, but I am so grateful for you all too 
uh, and those who are watching at home. And uh, it's been such a blessing to get to work with y'all. Y'all are so fun. And uh, I know that this past year was a little sparse with the Hangouts, but um, really I am looking forward to what y'all have in front of you going into high school, going into college. Um, and I hope that you continue to feel that St. Michael's is a home for you uh, and that the, whoever comes in and replaces me can also make you feel like this is a place where you can come have fun and learn and grow yourselves as well. So thank you. I love you all. And I'll be here uh, after the church service for donuts and coffee and chatting. I also just want to say a personal note of um, we're really, really proud of Luis and I am. I'm also proud of you. You know, uh, I think that as a congregation, uh, part of our work uh, is to raise up leaders, uh, to uh, be a place where people can be formed and then sent off. And uh, in this case, uh, we have gotten Luis started and uh, this will culminate in a priest in God's church. And so I want St. Michael's to feel good about their role in that. Um, Luis uh, mentioned his lovely bride, Marie, who's over there. I want you to just to wave. And uh, after the service, we are going to have uh, coffee and donuts. It's going to be kind of right outside. And just would love for you to stay a little bit if you can and to chat and um, to say goodbye to Luis. Um, one other big announcement, which is um, today, the Diocese of Texas has chosen to celebrate the Pauli Murray Feast Day. And Bishop Doyle has asked each of the churches in the diocese to allocate the loose plate offering to the Polly Murray Scholarship, which provides living expenses uh, for African American and other seminarians of color at the Episcopal Seminary of the Southwest. It's a relatively new scholarship. It's named after the Reverend Polly Murray, who is one of our church's trailblazing contemporary saints. She was the first African-American woman ordained a priest in the Episcopal Church, and before her ordination, she was a really impactful civil rights lawyer, also a very accomplished poet and author. And um, our own Lee Crawford serves on the committee that oversees that scholarship. Our church is very proud to be involved in it. And so aside from today's loose offering, we will designate uh, at least $1,000 on top of that as a church to offer uh, support for that scholarship. And friends, that is your generosity in action that it enables us to do that. Um, this scholarship is not just about raising money, but also raising awareness. And so the last thing I want to commend to you is an extra sermon, which was sent out this morning uh, from my very good friend and classmate, Bishop Phoebe Roaf, who is the Bishop Diocesan in the Diocese of West Tennessee. And so we are currently not passing um, the plates. Um, we haven't uh, returned that practice. Um, as I say these words, fear not, little flock, we will soon pass those plates again. <laughs> However, there is a plate in the back of the church, and if you would like to give towards the Polly Murray Scholarship, um, please know that I believe, and this church believes, it's a very good use of your generosity. Um, finally, uh, I just commend the trumpet to you, which is our newsletter, and the link for Vacation Bible Camp, which is all about compassion, and will be taking place the first week of August, is now live. And so I want you to know that. Uh, in terms of communion, I like to offer instructions every week, as I know many people are coming back. You will be invited to come forward to receive communion. If you need a gluten-free wafer, please let us know. We are offering the cup, but only for intinction right now, which is when you take the consecrated bread and you dip it in the wine. Um, we're not yet drinking from the chalice. Um, that will come um, later on in the fall, we hope. And um, I believe that is about it. Is anyone celebrating a birthday or an anniversary who wants to come forward for their blessing today? Okay, Ken, welcome. Oh, and we have Hope. Do you have a birthday as well? Uh, oh, that's I lovely. I could have a I th you know, I think 15 years of priestly ordination is, is definitely... And it's uh, a blessing in itself. 
Congratulations. Amen. <laughs> Congratulations. That's yeah. wonderful. And Ken, we're having a birthday? Birthday this okay. week. Okay. Well, let us pray. Oh God, our times are in your hand. Look with favor, we pray, on your servants as they begin a brand new year. Grant that they may grow in wisdom and grace and strengthen their trust in your goodness all the days of their life. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now, remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Happy birthday. And Hope, thank you for responding to the call to be a priest. We're a better church with you in it. So thank you. Yeah. Friends, walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God. Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, for you are the source of light and life. You made us in your image and called us to new life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. 
And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, and this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, and the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food and the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart, Through Christ our Lord. Amen. And now the peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts, keep your minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now, remain with you always. Amen.